All right, so uh, excited to, to be here and talking with my, my friend Wayne Eldred and uh, one of the, the probably the greatest uh, restaurateurs and, uh, and hospitality gurus, if it will take that, that tone that, that I've ever known. And um, I just wanna, wanted to invite him here today and, and ask him a little bit about what's going on in hospitality because obviously that's probably one of the single most hardest hit uh, industries that uh, that has been affected by the whole COVID nineteen shutdown, and to kind of get his perspective and hear a bit about what he was doing and <clears throat> experiences he's had so far. So, uh, Wayne, why don't you you start off and just kind of tell us a little bit about uh, about your background? And I know you have uh, you know two separate companies that are really both in kind of the hospitality and events and in place. And tell us a little bit about uh, about them and what you do uh, for folks there. And then we'll we'll just kind of talk about what's going on. Well, thanks, Will, first off, for having me. Um, yeah, so obviously, uh, since I uh, shut down the restaurant about a year ago, I just focused on my other two companies. I have a, an events production and AV company called Brown Label. Uh, we, we focus predominantly on um, events production and audio video uh, uh, outlays. So galas, uh, concerts, uh, 3D mapping, holographic projection, Anything, uh, anything in the entertainment field. So direct, direct uh, uh, integration for hospitality. And then my other company is uh, my, uh, it's basically called Eldred Hospitality Management and Consulting Group. That is a company that we basically do soup to nuts, restaurant and uh, uh, F&B development. So anything, anything to do with F&B, whether it be, you know, uh, just an overview of something, just to help people make sure that they go in the right direction or a direct soup to nuts, meaning that, you know, let's say you call me up and say, Hey, I won the lottery. I want to open up a restaurant Yeah, and uh, we'll come in and we'll literally from uh, design to construction, all the way to uh, training, launching menu development, the whole nine yards. So <clears throat> one stop shop. Yeah. And so um, F and B there, that's food and food and beverage for the food and beverage uninitiated. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's, uh, you know, F and B, F and B is, you know, it's, it's basically the, the short for a much, much bigger industry. You know, obviously F and B kind of drives hospitality right now. So, um, you know, whether it be, you know, for example, I'm doing five restaurants right now in three different hotels. Uh, they were all soup to nuts, uh, started on these projects, uh, about a year ago. Um, two of them were supposed to go live in, in March. Two was supposed to go live in April, and one was supposed to go live in uh, mid-year, but all that obviously got uh, postponed. Um, so, you know, the, the, the positives are is, that, you know, these hotels uh, can continue to set their stuff up and, you know, just be a little bit more accurate and precise about what they want. And then um, finally, when we're able to get back into those kitchens and restaurant spaces, you know, I can go in and, and work with the team and uh, their management team as well and help guide them and make sure that they're executing and trained appropriately to, to, to take on a lot of cabin fever guests. When yeah. They come out of this. <clears throat> so, well, I mean, so many, so many things with that uh, and you're right there. And I definitely want to kind of come back to that, that, that cabin fever and kind of on the, the outlook, but you know, no, no surprise that these projects got pushed back um, to, to whenever, um, whenever they're going to be like, how, from 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 your aspect or from your your perspective where you're at i mean are, are a lot of these things are they just getting pushed back are people still you know hopeful and and just kind of delaying things and just kind of treating this like if it was a you know a permitting delay from the the city or 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 those kinds of issues or is it just completely killed other deals and in other spaces when I mean, what how are people well, handling it in kind of the, the the higher level i guess well, I can tell you this, you know, if, if you don't, if you didn't walk into this uh, quarantine with, with fairly deep pockets, um, you are definitely going to have some, some major obstacles. Uh, you know, fortunately for me, uh, uh, on this particular set of projects, they all come out of one large hospitality group. They have about 70 hotels under, under management right now. So, you know, are they taking a beating? Of course. I mean, it's just, I mean, revenues are just going to be, you know, dismantled. I mean, if you're, if you are open, you're maybe doing 15 to 20% occupancy, maybe. Yeah. 
Uh, if you're not open, well, you know, there's a ton of fixed costs in our business that just don't go away. Right. You know, a lot of times people think it's just rent. I mean, to give you an idea, if I were to look back at uh, one of my restaurants, you know, rent was just under forty thousand dollars a month. But if your break-even point was, I think we were running about a three hundred and ten thousand dollar break-even point monthly. You know, forty versus three ten are two entirely different numbers. So even if you got back the forty, um, without revenues coming in, it's, it's a it's a very a very painful situation to be in. So, you know, restaurants in general work off very small margins. Most people uh, don't necessarily know that or understand that. And uh, if you're not past break even, which most restaurants are not past break, uh, break even, you know, every, every cent that does not come in on the top line uh, just becomes a huge negative number, right? A balloon. It's a, it's a, it's a reverse yeah. balloon. It just balloons up at the bottom. And so, being that hospitality is driven by cash flow, it, uh, I think, I think uh, sadly, on the opposite side of this, this quarantine, there's, by the end of this year, I think we're probably going to see about a 50% loss in hospitality, especially the mom and pops. They're not going to be able to stay open. The yeah. bigger companies are basically going to sit there uh, once, once, once we get the opportunity to reopen and they're going to look at their books and they're going to say, well, you know, this has been a dog for a long time. And I think we're going to take this, we're going to chalk this one up as a write off, take this off our books entirely. Um, because, he, you know, here's the thing, William, if you think about it, you know, let's just say that tomorrow uh, government says, look, uh, we're, we're no longer in quarantine. Right. Right. Go back right. to business. There is not a single soul that's going to walk back out there and not think 300 times before they touch something, before they go somewhere, Yeah. Um, especially families or elderly. So what happens is, is that your consumer confidence in the hospitality industry is not going to come back. And I can tell you this, living through, you know, two depressions there on Miracle Mile. One was obviously eight, nine, ten. And then, uh, and then, you know, obviously the Coral Gables, uh, you know, construction and streetscape, which really was prefaced with Zika, right? So we had our own yeah, pandemic yeah. locally. And Zika was, I mean, it was brutal. I mean, I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of revenue in a year that should have been by far my biggest year in the history of my restaurant. And um, I used to watch people getting out of their cars uh, at valet and literally hose themselves, hose themselves down in... Uh, in awe for bug spray, whatever. In bug spray. Yeah. I mean, just hose themselves down. I mean, like they were like, it was, it was unbelievable. Right I mean, I was watching, watching it so many times. And then, um, you know, and, and the Zika thing never really, really bounced back for, I would say probably about almost a year. Really? It took about that long for people. Cause I used to, I have friends all over the country and I had a, uh, two particular friends that were living down in Florida, got married, moved up to Chicago, and uh, they were supposed to come down. They have family in Florida, and they were supposed to come down. I said, well, you know, we're, not, we're just not going to chance it. My wife's pregnant. We're not chancing it. And so they waited an entire year before they came back down. Wow. And, um, I mean, it was, I mean, millions and, I mean, it was billions of dollars worth of loss to, to, to Miami. Yeah. Billions. Well, you, you, know, you mentioned the, the cabin fever on the hospitality, and I guess maybe that's a little bit more with the hotel. You know, some of the conversations I've been having with folks is, you know, when this thing very, you know, really got started and they just started with social distancing and, and before the, the full kind of lockdown thing and say, you know, I, I give it about two to three weeks before we start seeing like a lot of civil unrest and, and things and people just being completely stir crazy. And that may not the whole population, you know, and, you know, everybody was complaining about the spring breakers that were, you know, not actual Floridians as a lot of people pointing that out and usually flying in from all over the place. But you know, do you not see kind of the, the flip side of that or pot, part of the population being, you know, so pent up after being this, that when it is lifted, like they're going to be out in, um, you know, in force. Well, I think, I think, I think to a certain extent, the youth, anybody that is a healthy individual that doesn't have an autoimmune, autoimmune disease um, and doesn't have any asthmatic or, you know, 
the pre-existing conditions or pre-existing uh, conditions, I think you will see absolutely getting back out there. You know, um, I mean, people are, people are missing their gyms. They're missing everything. You know, um, I, I do think that there's a, a ton of elderly people um, that, you know, take my father, my father's 76. I would not want my dad just going back out there. Uh, like it uh, was, you know, last year. Um, because, you know, my dad has diabetes, uh, you know, he had a heart condition many, many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want anything to happen though. You know, right. I've been to one funeral this last decade. I don't want to go to another one you know, no. uh, for my family. No. So, um, and so I think, I think it, it would be wise for people to really heed the warning of being in quarantine, not putting themselves in a situation where they're basically, you know, transacting, uh, this virus, you know, because but the reality is, is that we know that in some cases that obviously it can last in the human being. They say 14 days. The chances are it's probably more than that. I think that's probably an average. Um, I think, uh, you know, we know that there, the, the virus and the perfect conditions can last on surfaces for a significant amount of time. Yeah. For like um, three days on stainless steel. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, do we, do we want to put ourselves in that situation? Uh, no. Um, and you know, it started with one person. And so you can have 99% clean. And then all of a sudden one person spreads it to another person. And you know, something tells me that this thing has been around a lot longer though. Oh, certainly. Um, right. And you said to get like critical just, mass or something. Yeah. So just based on these numbers that we're getting back, right. So if you look at the statistics of it, um, in order for these numbers to get so broadly distributed across the world, right? I mean, this is not, you have to think about how many people must have been infected. So this has really been going around for a long time. Um, you know, even if you look at the map and you look at some of the countries, I mean, there are like remote islands off the coast of Africa that have coronavirus 19. I mean, like remote yeah. islands, like really, yeah. really like by Madagascar kind of remote. I'm like, how is that possible? So, you know, it sounds like this thing really happened a while back. Um, they're just catching wind of it. And now as we start testing more and more people, we're realizing that, wait a minute, there is a massive amount of people. And so, you know, it's just like to your point, it's just, I think we're getting that critical mass point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like, you know, whether it started, you know, I've heard, you know, people joke about bats or, or pangolins or, or whatever, you know, it's being spread around. If it does have, did have these like flu type symptoms um, and just a little bit worse, like, you know, it's possible that it was being spread around for months, you know, and, and that, that you know, Wuhan being a, a, a highly industrialized area and, you know, people flying in and out of there, you know, they were spreading it around and, and, and dropping off all over the world, like you say, for, for probably sure. months before that before they really recognize like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't the flu. This is something, you know, significantly different. And, you know, it in that same family with like SARS <laughs> and mares and, and all that kind of stuff. So maybe they, they shut it down. But if it was, you know, I think one of the most significant things that I saw was that, you know, people were infectious before they were showing symptoms, you know, days Correct. before they were showing symptoms. So you'd have no reason to suspect it. And so then it's already out there being spread around. Um, and so I, I think that that's the biggest thing that's driven all of this, right? Is not that, you know, people sit, they sick or when you get home, when you get sick, stay home. When you, don't, you know, people having to, are having to stay home, not even knowing if they're sick or not. And, and honestly, henceforth, why we are, henceforth, why we are where we are. And, you know, uh, look, I'm a business guy, um, but, you know, I, I, if, if I, if I had to put myself in the position of the president or the governor, um, I would have done probably the same thing, you know, yeah. because when you got to protect people, um, you know, what, what, what other choices do you really have? You know, yes, is business going to suffer? And are, are we going to, are we going to see an unbelievable high unemployment rate after this? Sure. You know, but, but like anything, and you know, I'm not discounting the people that have died and that are suffering right now. And I'm not discounting the fact that there's a lot of good people that will lose their companies in this. Um, but, you know, the one thing I will tell you about America is that we are very resilient people. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I do think that 
um, the new norm will no longer be, the new norm will be the future. Yeah. I think, I think, I think there's going to be a ton of people, you know, sort of like what we're doing right now that would be like, well, I don't really need to go to work. I've accomplished everything I need to accomplish from my desk at home. And why don't you shrink your office space, save yourself that money, pay your, your employees more to be at home. Right. I think that's going to absolutely take off. Um, uh, I think, I think moving forward, if government doesn't install this, would be silly for them to have high sanitation efforts on any public transit. Yeah. You know, planes, packaging. You know, if you think about it packaging wise, right? Like for example, UV light will disinfect allegedly the coronavirus strain nineteen, right? So obviously you don't want to have people around there, but if you are shipping something, you know, to keep a UV light on in that shipping area could basically wipe out most bacteria and germs from traveling from one part of the world to another part of the world, right? Um, so there's a, the, the new norm is, um, is the future, yeah. you know, and, and it's interesting enough, it, it couldn't have come at a better time when, you know, if you look, if you watch the tech world right now, um, the two things that are really coming on the map. And, and I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars worth of investment in two things, AI, which is artificial intelligence. Right. And AR, which is augmented reality, right? All right, right. And so now you're putting yourself in a situation for anybody that's an AI or AR is going to be like, well, totally. We could totally take your, your white space there that you just said you set up, right? And augment yourself anywhere you want to be. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, you know, the funny thing is I, I'm, I'm doing these, you know, the, these meetings and just kind of like one-on-one -on -one interviews like this. Uh, you're also doing the, the large group meetings and, and one of the – kind of fairly innocuous, but kind of annoying things in large group meetings is people getting onto this stuff for the first time. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, let me, you know, where are the, 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 the settings and you know, they're going to, to, to come in here and uh, I'm not even sure where it's at right now, but, um, but you know, got to think about this. Things, though, people like, are, people are like throwing up the, the false backgrounds and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, all of a sudden having weird, uh, you weird things pop up and you just see them kind of playing around with other stuff. You know, they're not, not, not really engaged, but um, you know, it, it, it all, well, look, it take, is becoming, becoming. Take a, take, take a company like zoom, right? Zoom has been around for a few years. Oh yeah. But this, this quarantine completely put them on the map. Absolutely. There used to be a day where you would never even hear the word zoom. It would be, there were so many other companies that you could have used to do what we're doing right now. Right. You know, and they just, not a single person in the last three weeks has done this with me not using Zoom. Right. It's crazy, it's, right? So it this, is. And this I, is the beginning of a brand new. No, completely. For, for them and, 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 you know, there's other ones. And it's the, the this kind of goes to just a general market trend and a lot of stuff I think we, we've seen with innovation. So, you know, I, I moved from Miami to, to Orlando a few years ago. And so uh, I, I've been using Zoom because one of my mentors, excuse me, introduced it to me and I'd seen Google Hangouts and all, you know, Skype was the traditional one. And, yep. um, you know, he, he showed it to me and, and it's like, man, the, this, the video quality, they'd had a lot of stuff that was that much better. So even before they did a big public launch, I'd been using Zoom. So I've been able to just kind of watch them grow up and, and do this. And some of the, the features and things they had, like these breakout rooms that you can do with large groups is a, is a huge thing I'm a fan of. And it really does a good job of being able to, 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 to recreate as close as you can to a, uh, to a live event. Like I've even talked with the, the chamber. I'm like, you know, you can have basically your normal good morning Coral Gables with a, a Zoom meeting if you know how to use breakout rooms and do that for table networking and you can generally have a speaker and still kind of go through the same kind of stuff but people don't adopt that because it's like i tell people all the time in marketing right people are, are caught up in the whirlwind of their daily lives and everything and unless they have a problem that is immediately in front of them it's going to be really hard to get their attention or to to be able to show them why they should change some process or implement something new or buy your product or buy your service you have to create a huge value proposition unless that problem is right in front of them. And so, you know, Zoom's been, been coming up and, and getting in front of people and been sustainable and boom, all of a sudden something happens in the market and now everybody has that problem 
and they're looking for the thing that's going to provide the the best solution. So, you know, it's a it's a forced diffusion curve in terms of that innovation. I think, and I, and and I think we're going. To, you're you're right on track. We're going to see that with a lot of uh, a lot of things. And actually, it brings me to to kind of two of the the real questions that I I wanted to to really hear from you from uh, you know, one from kind of a broader perspective than just hospitality and F and B, but you know the the commercial real estate market. Um, you know, obviously been directly involved with that and you were talking about it before and, and how much rent has changed. And I know that's one of the, the big things that seems to drive the ever, uh, you know, just in, in Coral Gables, you know, got rated one of the, the top foodie cities in America, or number one, a couple of years ago, something like that. But mm -hmm. you know, it seems like the churn in restaurants there is like every six to, to, to nine months almost. And I know the, the rents have had a lot of things to, to do with that. But to, to your point you said before, like uh, people working virtually, I, I see a lot of folks stepping back after this, even after quarantine is lifted and saying, why am I paying for all this office space? You know, is there really a lot of value of having the, the, the team come in? And, and I know there've been studies of, about that with uh, you know, Harvard Business Review, looking at companies that, that offered more virtual options and whatnot, but it wasn't the norm. It was still kind of this outlier thing that people were kind of trying. Now everybody's sure. been forced into experiencing this. They're going to come back. You know that are, are people going to to, to stop doing um, their their big office layouts, or are they going to have killed off a lot of the the small mom and pop retail and restaurants and those kind of things? What do you see happening to to commercial real estate, and how does it how does it evolve or change after this? So, you know, that's a, that's a great question. It's a, and unfortunately, it's not going to be a short answer. So if you got a minute, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So, yeah, all you need, bud. so let's, let's, uh, let's, let's peel it back a little bit to uh, a couple of years ago, right? So since basically 2008, when the world fell apart, um, you know, the, the real, the, the only thing that really got fixed in, uh, by the government was the housing real estate market. Right. The commercial real estate market never, they never saw a lot of, um, relief they never saw a lot of, kind of so, some so kind of relief or any kind of bailout or anything like that. Well, the, the commercial market didn't need it as much as the housing market needed it, right? Sure. So the commercial market sort of didn't get touched. And what happened was, is that interest rates then dropped. Right? And so when you have really low interest rates, right? we've had interest rates at this level or lower for what now, almost 12 years? Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So if you think about that, that's a, that's, a historic, that's a historic high. And so what happens is, is that if you look at commercial real estate, right? Back in the days when you were buying, when you were buying properties uh, of, of a large size and, uh, and numeric value, your average your average interest rate was going to be anywhere from about, let's just say six and a half percent all the way up to like 14 and a half percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, and six and a half was like, if you had, I mean, you had tons of money in the bank that could capitalize it uh, and protect it. And then, uh, you know, on average, you were looking anywhere from nine to anywhere to 14% on some of these commercial, uh, commercial loads. Well, when, when, when those rates dropped, if you're a hedge fund, a private equity, uh, or a person with a ton of money, you put yourself in a situation where you can take, you can change your pro forma to take on more weight because you're getting a huge discount on the back end of this loan. Yeah. Right? So the average person on a 30 year mortgage will basically pay about, I think, two and a half, just under two and a half times their house value, right? So, now, obviously, commercial are typically 10-year loans. Um, but what happens is, is that so it basically set up this perfect place to go out and buy these properties at really low interest rates, do some type of minimum improvements, dress it up, put some lipstick on the pig, and then go ahead and flip it, flip it, flip it, right? So we're at a point where we're, we're way up here on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the valuation. The problem is, is that a lot of those especially mixed use buildings, their number one rent roll came from brick and mortar, ground floor restaurant retail. Yeah. And the mixed right. use, you're talking about restaurant retail on the bottom and it's a condo or if it's an office space or something like that. Or both. Yeah. Like my old building was condo, office, 
parking, and restaurant retail, right? So that's a, that's a perfect, uh, perfect scenario. So uh, and let's talk about that specifically, because I think that, that is what we see more in like Brickell, Coral Gables, New York, whatever it might be. Um, so here's what happens, right? About just, just about 10 years ago, Amazon basically wiped out brick and mortar retail. Yeah. And they just wiped them out. The difference is that brick and mortar then just said, brick and mortar retail said, well, you know what? If we can figure out how to advertise well and have good product placement on Amazon, we can just move to a warehouse and we could do 10 times the amount of business with a fraction of the cost of being on Miracle Mile or Brickle Avenue, wherever it might be. Yeah. So exactly what happened to Amazon happened to the restaurant industry about five years ago. And really more so in the last two and a half years with Uber Eats, DoorDash, and a lot of these food delivery services. And so Uber Eats basically comes out, they're taking on average anywhere from 28 to 33 cents on the dollar from the restaurant. So if, if I'm sending you $100 worth of food, it costs me 33 bucks. Yeah. Right? Well, guess what? Restaurants don't make 33 cents on the dollar. No. Right? So then they charge you anywhere from 25 or 20 to 40% on their side between delivery fee, service fee, and gratuity. Yep. Right. Yep. So they're, they're raking it in and obviously a portion goes back to the driver, <clears throat> but they're making, in theory, they're making a lot of money. I don't know how they're not making a lot of money in the stock market uh, as, a, as a publicly traded company, but for some reason they're not making money. So they're on average there if before distributions uber for example is making let's say 30 60 they're making about 80 cents on the dollar before distributions so every dollar that comes in on the top line for a restaurant they're making about 80 cents on that okay so here's the big issue restaurants don't make 33 cents in profit on average we just don't, especially if you're on Miracle Mile or on a, on a high density street, you, your, your profit margins are dramatically less. Um, so you're sending your food out, okay? If people are gonna order from you. Now, if you're an experiential restaurant, if you're a, a medium to high end quality restaurant, most people do not wanna order that kind of food to their house and their breeds. Yeah. Because there's no value in it. Part of the value is being in that yeah. immersed in that experience, right? So, for example, take Hillstone down on Miracle Mile, right? They've been forced to become a pickup restaurant, right? Well, there's a the restaurant that does $14 million a year in business. So, I mean, this is going to wipe out. I mean, think how much cash flow this is going to wipe out from them. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just going to wipe them out. They're going to lose, and on a monthly basis, they're going to lose north of a million dollars in revenue. Yeah, And because they do such great numbers, their breaking point is obviously tremendously lower. So, I mean, the actual profitability of that company is going to take a huge hit. Right. And uh, <clears throat> that's a problem. That's a problem for a company like that. So, so what happens is, is that now if you look at mainstream streets, brick and mortar retailers are gone. There's no real value there unless you're like in downtown Chicago where there's a ton of tourism. Um, you know, no one's, no one's going to Miracle Mile to buy, to buy uh, retail stuff. Right. And if you go down Miracle Mile now, for example, there's not a lot of restaurants you want to go to. Yeah. If there are any restaurants. I mean, there's a fraction of restaurants down there. Yeah, very. And they're getting charged an astronomical amount of money. And so what happens is, <clears throat> is... It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to go and work as hard as like I used to work to just pay all that money to a landlord yeah. where basically, and every year that number goes up. It doesn't make financial sense at some point, right? You get, you get this, you know, yep. this is, this is the problem. The risk you know? and the reward or the, so the this, would, this would be the restaurant income. Uh, and then this would be the landlord. So at some point that's just going to keep going. So, you actually get, you get penalized by your own landlord. Your yeah. landlord ends up being your biggest issue. Uh, as long as all things are, you know, you're running it while you have good quality, good service, right? So 
you see that do you see that reversing now like after after this or like with all these other issues is that is that going to I, I really don't, and, and here's why I really don't. You know, people people still love the convenience of having Uber bring them everything. Sure. Um, you know, uh, the Uber model, I'm not knocking it. I think, I think the issue with the Uber model is, is that they, it's one thing to charge me something if I'm ordering it. It's another thing to penalize the restaurant. Yeah. You know, if they were to take five cents on the dollar, it'd be very different if they'd been taking 33 cents on the dollar, right? Um, I think you'd get more restaurants uh, involved in that. I think you'd get better quality that way because now restaurants can look at that and say, look, that's added value. But, yeah. but, it, but financially speaking, right, let's just take, take my restaurant, Tarpon, right? Yeah, for those, that, not, those that, that didn't know, I don't think we mentioned it, like you, you ran tar Tarpon Bin on, the, on Miracle Mile for, for many, many years. 15 years. Um, so, but think about it. Well, like, for example, you know, we were mostly predominantly uh, a seafood restaurant. Yeah. You know, so I would say about in your great humility, I, I've heard you introduce yourself as a, a purveyor of uh, French fries and fish sticks. Many fish times. fingers and French fries. That's right. There we go. Uh, so we, we uh, you know, I'd say about 70% of our menu was seafood. Well, guess, you know, seafood doesn't travel well. You know, I mean, uh -huh. if you're ordering seafood to your house, on average, that seafood is not going to be great. So for us, when, when, when the huge Postmates Uber Eats of the world started taking over, you know, we adopted Postmates because Postmates had the, lo the lowest rate out of the two. But the reality is, is that we didn't do a ton of business with it. Not because we didn't want to do a ton of business with it, but because most people wanted to physically be in our space. Well, and I, and so just to, just to say it too, I, and, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk to you about, about this is, and you know, I said your humility on, on fish fingers and, and French fries or, or, or whatever, but the, the reality is, uh, while the, I think you, you always kept, uh, tarpon to be very, uh, very accessible, right. And, you know, it wasn't some, some ultra high end restaurant though. The, the quality and the, the, the service was on par with any restaurant. I'd put it against any restaurant in, uh, in all of, of Dade County. And that, that was the experience. I mean, there was plenty of people who could, you know, come in and, and you know, burger deals on Tuesdays or, you know, the, uh, the legendary Friday nights uh, there as well. You know, people would come in for, for all that things. And it was largely, I believe, the, the experience that drove that. Yeah, you know, our goal was, you know, we, we, we wanted to be a daily dining destination. So if you want to be a daily dining, dining destination, the number one thing you have to focus on is value. Yeah. And so, you know, and so what is value, right, in the hospitality uh, industry? Well, it's, it's underselling and over-delivering. You know, our goal was not to go out there and say, look, we're the best at anything and everything. Our goal was to be out there and be that, that mom and pop restaurant, but really run very well. And so when guests walked in the door, you know, on average, someone would know your name. Uh, we would know what you want to eat and drink. And we would have, you know, our, my, my servers and bartenders, they went through 14 days of training in some cases. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was a, a very stringent training program. And the idea behind it is, is that, you know, when you go out on the floor to serve your first table, no guest should ever know you just came out of training. Yeah. Right. And that is one of the biggest mistakes in our industry is that you learn about 20, 30 percent in the average restaurant and they throw you out on the floor and you're out there hurting your guests that have been with you for a long time. And I, I just never wanted that to happen. So we put a lot of a lot of effort on that on that training aspect, but you know, not to digress from the, the subject at hand, which was basically uh, commercial real estate. Um, so going back to the economics, right? So just to give you an idea, in the last two years, the the National Restaurant Association uh, spread some numbers, um, and if you if you do the math on it, foot traffic into restaurants prior to quarantine. Oh, I'm going to say this again foot traffic into restaurants prior to quarantine in the last two years have dropped by over 50%, five zero. Before quarantine. Before quarantine. Foot traffic into restaurants nationally in the last two years have dropped by 50% because of the Uber Eats of the world and so on and so forth, right? So let's do the math on this, right? So obviously people are still ordering food. They're just ordering food at their house, right? So if you're ordering food at your house, 
what don't you need to order? You don't need to typically order alcohol, right? You don't need to order bottles of water. You don't need to order dessert. You don't need to order coffee. You don't need to order a whole, uh, any, uh, any, any, any margin stuff that the, the restaurant made their money on. Correct. Right. So what is the lost opportunity cost? Well, that number for the average restaurateur like myself, that number can be anywhere from 60 to 125%. Now let me explain the 125%, right? So the 60 is a number that, you know, people love to have a cocktail at the restaurant. Sure. Right. The 125% is, is that they're like, you know what? I don't want to order to go food from this restaurant. And so I'm not going to order from them at all because I don't want to destroy that quality of food. So the, the, that's a hundred percent that you lost. Right. So the 25% is the gratuity that got lost too. Yeah. Right. And so that's the 125%. Because on average, my, my team made about 25% on every check in gratuity. And that, that's the whole point of training them well. Right. So, so what does that mean? Well, now you have a restaurant. People are not ordering from you online because you're, not, you're an experiential restaurant. You know? And you're, you're that experiential restaurant. So you, if they're not physically coming to see you, they're not buying anything from you yeah right absolutely so so now think about it you're still paying these massive rents but over 50 percent of your guests are no longer coming in to the physical building right and out of that 50 percent, depending on the type of restaurant you are there could be an astronomical amount of money uh, that is not being spent even on those apps yeah so so what's going to happen is is that your brick and mortar main main restaurant street restaurants are not going to last. They're so not going to be able to make it. So what what how do you see that industry evolving? You know, even even before this, if this was kind of like the nail in the coffin, then we we're already seeing this fifty percent. Right. Like you know, there there's still going to be a demand for people wanting to 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 go out and and go out to to, to eat per se, or to to have some kind of social gathering or take somebody out on a date, uh, do a special occasion, something like that. Hold on just a second. The joy of having the kids at home. That's um, okay. But um, the, the, I mean, that, there's still going to be somewhat of a demand. So how, how do you see restaurants adapting or evolving to, to meet that after all of this? So here's how, here's, if, if I was looking at it globally, not as a restaurant tour, right? If I was looking at it from the outside in, listening to our, our interview, right? Uh, and let's say I own a bunch of properties, mixed use properties. Here's what I would, this is what I would want to want to hear. Well, if we know brick and mortar is destroyed on ground floor retail and restaurant, if I'm a landlord, what I would be looking for is to find the absolute bless, the best ground floor retailers I could find give them a deal that they cannot refuse. Okay. And then I would take whatever that performer of interest rate or uh, lost revenue and spread it through everybody above them. Because the problem is a lot of times people, when they buy an, or they rent an office space, they want to be in a building that is convenient and has amenities. Yeah. And so if one of those amenities is to be able to take the elevator down to my restaurant or go to the jewelry store or do this or do that, and that's not there anymore, well, why am I paying all this rent to be in the office space above? This makes no sense. It's a waste of money for me. Absolutely. And so if you want to fill the upper floors, you have to have a good ground floor. Because, I mean, think about it. When I close my restaurant, I mean, if I were to estimate the economic impact for downtown Coral Gables, it was probably close to $30 million worth of impact. Sure. And so that number is not only our sales that we generated, the parking sales. And I think the number I estimated on parking was about 6 million in parking a year. Yeah. You know, think about it, just parking, 6 million parking, right? I had multiple colleagues of mine in the business that were around us. One guy called me up, he's like, Wayne, since you've been gone, we're down over 50% in revenue 
because they would start with you and then come to us. Yeah. And that's all gone. They're not coming to the Gables anymore because there's nothing like you in the Gables. That's right. And so that money that went downtown Coral Gables now is no longer going to the Gables at all. It's just being, it's going somewhere else. It's being distributed uh, in other locations. So to contend with this thing, you, you and, and, and like you said, we're going to want to go to restaurants. And at some point, we're going to realize that the valuation from Uber Eats and Postmates is not great because it's not great now. You know, and it's, I order from Postmates and Uber Eats from time to time. I, I don't love it, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Sure. You know, but it comes in. Most of the time, there's something wrong with it. Most of the time, the food quality is crap, right? And then you look at the bill, and the bill's massive. Yeah. Even the bill's more, massive. And there's, there's no sin back, right? Yeah, and, 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 and that's the thing. You know, you, it's not like you can call a manager to the table and say, hey, listen, uh, I think there's a problem with this. It's like you just, you're stuck with it. And, yeah, you can complain and write a review, but you know how it is. No one, no one cares. No one cares. So, so that's, that's the primary way of dealing with it is that if you are a mixed-use building and you have a way to distribute the difference, you basically charge, you know, it's much easier to take, you know, five or six ground floor take the difference and spread that up amongst 40, 50, 60 different entities, Yeah, you know, because it's a much smaller margin of increase for those guys. Sure. Um, uh, it, I, the other thing too is, is that, you know, since property values have been, you know, people are constantly buying these buildings and paying more and more money for them because of this interest rates, right? Especially now, right? The interest rates are back down ground floor again. You know, it forces restaurants that want to be on the Miracle Mile or on the main street because of the rent, it forces them to have to charge more for something that they shouldn't have to charge as much for. Yeah. You know, I, I have to charge a certain amount of money for my food and beverage just because of the location I was in. Yeah. And it sucked because, because the reality is, is that when you are a value driven brand, and you're forced to have to charge more for something, not because you're making more. It wasn't because I was making more. It was just because the landlord wanted more. Right. You know, I would have much rather had a lower rent rate, and I would have much rather dropped my prices down, not increase them, just because I could. Because the reality is, is that in businesses like mine, I would rather have more daily dining people than the people that would come out once a week. If I can get you two, three times a week, because I'm giving you that kind of value, it's actually better for us, right? Because it's the law of inertia in our, in our business. The busier we are more consistently, the easier it is to run an institution. Absolutely. When you have ebbs and flows, it's painful to run a restaurant. Because, you know, cats away, mice will play, people not focused on what they're supposed to focus on. Yeah. Um, and so you get a much higher level of inconsistency. Uh, so... Well, I think I think what you're describing right there is the uh, is probably the the general experience that most people have in a lot of restaurants throughout you know certainly throughout Miami uh, Dade County, but but all over the place. You know these places that had kind of like their one big night or uh, you know maybe one or two throughout the throughout the week. Um, but I, I I know that was always something that that definitely set Tarpon apart was just the, the level of training and service. And I know you're bringing that to, to some other other places, but, you know, just hypothetically, you know, after, after all of this, you know, say commercial real estate kind of gets reset in some ways or some people get smart and realize that they can't just abuse the, the ground floor. I mean, do you see, do you see a, a, a shift happening in the, just the industry itself into, you know, smaller floor plans, um, you know, more intimate dining experiences there, a higher, uh, uh, higher attention to, to, to service and uh, the, the quality that goes into things. And then maybe some of these, you know, smaller mom and pops that were, were just driving value. Maybe they, they, they move out of the, you know, places like the Gables where the rent is, is exceptionally high and, and realize that, that they can do just as not as much business if they, they get lower rent and can run through a, an Uber Eats or a Postmates and, and be able to, to do primarily delivery. Yeah, so multiple questions there. Um, you know, one, one of the things that's, that's happening right now in the industry, and this, this started out in Europe, 
um, is they're building, you know, for lack of a better term, remote slash cloud slash warehouse kitchens. And, um, you know, for example, let's just say that, you know, I wanted to open up, a, I'd go down, I'm in the Gables right now. So let's say I go to 8th Street um, and I, I buy a warehouse out there, 4,000 square feet. And I build a kitchen. It's for pickup or delivery service only. But in that kitchen, what I can do is I can basically make, uh, uh, I can run two, three restaurants from that kitchen. Right? Because you're not coming there. And so I can make tacos. I can make fish fingers and french fries. I can make burgers. I can make Chinese food. I can make Italian food. And it can be branded under different companies. But it's really one set of employees making all the same products, just packaging differently, right, and sending them out on their merry way. And so that, we're definitely going to see that happen. And it's already happening uh, in, in other parts of the world. They're going to start blowing up here. But the reality is that's only, that's only one part of it. That's only one part of the grand picture of hospitality. The reality is, is that if, if, if you are wanting to go into the restaurant industry, it's for the romanticism of being able to greet someone at the front door and, and see their kids grow up and serve them their favorite meal. Just to be a delivery service company, there's not a lot of romance to that. Well, right? Could there be a, and you see like a mix possibly of that, of like, so maybe you know, I'm gonna build a, a, a brand like a, you know, a high-end kind of a, a restaurant or, or a very, maybe not in the high-end in terms of prices, but the experience is gonna be there, but in a small footprint. But then I could have that that warehouse or something where I've got maybe a couple of those different things, like you said, the the all these different varieties of uh, of food or uh, types. Maybe they have storefronts located, you know, within five or ten miles of 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 that one little warehouse that's out in some some district, and you know, it's just dine in in these locations. But when anybody calls in and says, "Hey, I want this dish," you know, they they that goes over to the the, the distribution warehouse, I guess, to say anything like sure. that. And, and so that, that leads back to footprint, right? So I think, I think there's a combination of just being completely remote. There's a combination of having both. Um, if nothing were to change in commercial real estate, you're going to absolutely see restaurants forced to have to be in smaller footprints because yeah. they're not going to have the financial means to, uh, especially uh, the mom and pops, right? Um, they're not going to have the financial means to necessarily have these big restaurant spaces. Now, uh, when was the last time you were in downtown Coral Gables? Well, it should have been uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I guess I'll say even a month before that. So probably into February. So you were there when the new Cheesecake Factory went to the old brick top space, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's the smallest Cheesecake open. Factory. Just open, right. So that's, that's one of the smallest Cheesecake Factories you'll ever see. Yeah, absolutely. A cheesecake. Cheesecake is supposed to be these massive restaurant spaces. Um, and they took up, they took up, you know, typically 15, 20, sometimes even 30,000 square feet in some situations. They took a 10,000 square foot restaurant. Yeah. Right. So think about that. Um, so that's a prime example of, you know, we're not doing as much business, but we still want to do business because, you know, they're publicly traded and uh, they, they've basically, taken taken their their much bigger brand and they said let's let's try doing it in a smaller smaller a smaller position um now let's just say that commercial real estate does get fixed in this right first off to fix it you're gonna see i mean you're gonna see an epic fallout in financial commercial real estate yeah. epic yeah um <clears throat> So if most is mo if more if if people start realizing that they don't need these large office footprints anymore and they can work out of home, um, all those people's performers are going to go completely through the floor. They're not going to be able to. They're not going to gener generate the revenue to offset those prices anymore. And so what happens is is that the last person that bought that commercial real estate is not going to be able to make money on it. Right. Uh, the next person may depending on what, what the project sells for, but it might take another person after that sale to sell it at another lower price because they couldn't afford to keep it running. It might take two drops um, 
to be able to get to a, a, a place where people can actually perform in the building. In addition to that, um, if, if the convergence of augmented reality, uh, a huge span in uh, artificial uh, intelligence happens, people are staying at home, you're not going to, there's not going to be a need to build as much anymore. Yeah. Right. And so what, what I think will happen is you're going to put yourself in a situation where you can, which is actually good for the planet. Less construction is good for the planet. If, the, if people are just taking older buildings, fixing those, it's much, much healthier for the planet, not taking these massive footprints. Um, so I think you'll have an opportunity. I think there'll be an opportunity, but I mean, the fallout is going to make 2008 look like a walk in the park, mm. you know, because the average person losing a house was anywhere from 150 to $350,000. The average commercial building is in the millions typically. Absolutely. Right. So what you're going to see is if that happens, um, banks will be wiped out. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a massive wipeout of banks. Uh, I think you're going to have, you're going to be forced to see some type of bailout of banks again, um, because it's just going to be this monstrous amount of buildings coming online. Uh, because like I said, you, if, if you're, if you're a building owner and you, you were the last person to buy that building at the highest valuation it's ever been way above a fish, a, a smart market price. Yeah. You're now stuck with your restaurant and retailers, especially in this particular period of time, they're done. And so if you don't have these massive deep pockets, how do you come out of this? But more importantly, even with this bailout, the money that the government's going to give back to these hospitality is not going to suffice. Absolutely. That's the problem. And I, we can math, go do a the whole, math doesn't make sense. We can do a whole, whole separate interview just talking about how you know, the, the, the government interventions and all this are, are affecting it. Um, but I do know that we are, and we're kind of at the top of the hour where, uh, uh, where we sure. said got the, the rest of our day to get on. So uh, you know, how, how can people get in, get in touch with you if they, they are, you know, uh, you know, what, what have you got going on there? And um, what would you say is like the, the parting, maybe some parting advice for restaurateurs or folks that are in hospitality. They're just kind of figuring out how to survive. And what's the, what's the best you know, one minute piece of advice that you would give, give to them? Well, if, if you're not a, a true professional restaurateur and you're not in it to win it for the rest of your life, you're not going to have a better time to walk away from it than now. Number one. So that's the, that's the, that's the bottom 20%. If you're in the middle, um, you're going to have to get really, really creative to come out of this. And sadly, I think it's going to be really challenging to come out of this. And then if you're at the top of this, you know, this is the perfect time for you at the top to be a hero in the sense that you can do a lot of good in this, in this world uh, by being in hospitality, not only for team members, um, but, but for your community as well. Yeah. You know, so um, I just wish, I wish everybody a lot of, a lot of luck in this. I, I'm hoping that the SBA really comes through to help people out. Um, I don't, sadly, I don't think they'll, they'll be able to get the funds to people quick enough. You know, I had uh, I had, you know, I know already personally, I know about over 20,000 people that have been laid off from hospitality, you know, 20,000. I mean, payrolls uh, for certain restaurant groups are a million dollars a month. Yeah. Well, you know, the government sending you $10,000 for each restaurant is not going to cover a million dollars a month. Right. Uh, so, and if you have a $2 million cap and you've been shut down for three months, you're, you're negative a million. And that, to finance that million bucks is not going to happen. So, yeah. So, Will, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a sad time right now, you know. And I, and I just hope to God that uh, people out there are gonna, are gonna pick one of those three tiers and either stick with it or say, you know what, it's been great. Um, let me just take the high road and walk away from this. And you know, you'll be less shamed because of coronavirus than you would be if you just shut down your business during a normal year. Uh, and then if people need to. Call me. My number is 786-255-9144. That's my personal cell phone. And then my email address is w-e-l-d-r-e-d -E -E at eldred, e-l-d-r-e-d, cg.com. So w-e-l-d-r-e-d -E at eldredcg.com. So, you know, it's been a pleasure to, to chat with you. 
And um, well, I hope after all, hopefully, of this, uh, you know, comes back and quarantine's lifted, and I, you know, I'm, I'm still down in Miami on a, on a fairly regular basis. We can uh, go to, to some other restaurant you've helped open up and, and grab a drink. I would love that.